actress. <laughs> Anyway, we also have then, right after that, on that same day, we have Trunk or Treat, which is an annual event here in our parking lot, and we are, would love to have more trunks available. We are, have, there's no charge for that this year. We are just asking to, we're collecting some food for NACE, our local food shelf, so if you would bring that, if you're coming, that'd be lovely. And if you'd like to host a trunk, you can sign up on the bulletin board for Children, Youth, and Family. As we have seen in the news, uh, Hurricane Helene had, has done some terrible damage, and the Lutheran uh, Disaster Relief is collecting money for that and supporting that, and I'm sure they're on the ground there right now. If you are able and would like to uh, do some donations, we've got that QR code as well. Um, one of our members is there as part of the Red Cross, uh, Karen Maring, and she is working hard and hardly sleeping. Um, I have some sad news to report. One of our members died on Friday, uh, Jeanette Keeney. I knew Jeanette since the 70s and got to reconnect here. So um, the services will, arrangements will be, uh, are pending right now and will be announced as we know those. And now I would like to invite up Alicia Noreen. Good morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Alicia Noreen. My husband, Dustin, and I have three teenage kids. There's one standing right there. Um, when Pastor Kerry asked me if I'd be willing to share a little bit about why we give and why it's important to us, I didn't even hesitate. Um, typically, I don't type out my notes, but I've got a little windy this summer with the sermon series, so you're going to see me looking down a little bit more. When we first started attending our Saviors, our kids were somewhere around one, two, and four. We had been driving 30 miles to church, which meant we left 45 minutes or even an hour before service just to assure we'd arrive on time and then have enough time for potty breaks and a quick snack, hoping we could make it through the hour-long worship. I had been driving past this building on my way to work and decided one day, I wonder what denomination church that is. I wonder what this Our Saviors is all about. When I realized it was an ELCA Lutheran church, we decided to give it a try. The first week we attended, like many other young families at the time, we occupied the back pew. It was great because the kids could turn around, look out the windows behind us, see what was going on, and then stay relatively quiet, and we weren't a distraction back there. A couple more Sundays when our work schedules allowed, um, my husband was a police officer and I was a nurse, so weekends were often occupied by work, but when we both were off, um, we would come back, and um, you know, neither one of us were brave enough to bring three little kids alone. Um, so we generally um, were here just a few times, and one of the Sundays we arrived, we were late. And I quickly scanned the back pews, and pretty much everything was full, and we had an usher say, just come on, it's okay. And we kept walking and walking and walking, and I turned around and I looked at Dustin, and I was like, this is not good. This is not good. My heart was pounding. I think our nonverbals are pretty much the same. We can't sit that close. No, stop. Like, we'll sit right here. We're okay. Nope. Second pew right in front of the band. I thought, oh, boy, here we go. Um, I was probably pretty much terrified. I think my hands were pretty sweaty, and I've learned that God was looking out for us that day. He had a plan for us. You see, the kids were so busy watching the band since they were up close and personal and had that close-up view, they sat so well. I wasn't even sure they were the same kids I'd been breaking a sweat with many previous Sundays just to keep them from being disruptive. That same band has continued to be priceless to us. They have shown our family unconditional love and support. Samuel has been singing with this amazing group of humans for a while now, and they are our family. We refer to most of the women who are standing up here right now as church moms to our kids. One of them was even the best kindergarten teacher for all three of them. Even though we haven't officially adopted the church dad title for the men, they all have that honorary role. From celebrating birthdays, attending school and sports activities, being a listening ear, giving hugs and rides when needed, or maybe not needed because it's more fun to ride with somebody than other than mom and dad, they are a significant reason our family is part of our saviors and we give. Another reason is our children, youth, and family ministry programs. Two of our three kids attended preschool here when we had preschool, and then on Wednesday evenings, they participated in Wednesday evening programming. At that time, we had class not only for confirmation aged, but also younger kids. I love those Wednesdays because I didn't have to cook. I was a full-time student at that time and working part-time and being a mom, 
And so we didn't have a lot of opportunity to give financially at that time. So I offered to help clean up meals afterwards. Then, lucky for me, the kids were still occupied with programming, so I'd have just a little bit of time to work on homework, too. The best part about it was they were exhausted. Even after Wednesday, we, um, we had those short family-based worships. They slept really well. Giving doesn't always have to be financial. Giving your time and sharing your talents is an important part of giving, too. I've been part of the HR committee. I've served, also served as a healthcare professional supporting the pastors and council as we nav navigated COVID. And Dustin and I have volunteered to help transport youth to various church organized events. Helping not only our kids, but all youth feel loved and that same sense of belonging that our kids feel is important to us. We give so that other families can experience what ours has, hopefully that same and similar support and connection. Our kids remain involved here. Even after they have been confirmed, they want to be here and we don't, we don't force them to be, they come on their own. This congregation has created that space for them to be themselves and has given them opportunities to grow. As you can see, Samuel singing with the band still. He runs live stream slides and is dabbling in learning the soundboard. John, I can't believe you trust him with that. Madison, sitting right over here. She's employed part-time as a children, youth, and family youth assistant. She also helps run the live stream from time to time and will be representing our church and a few other churches at Churchwide Assembly next summer in Phoenix with me. Our youngest, Ryan, he's helped usher when he's here, but right now sports are in full swing. I'm sure when they slow down a little bit, he'll be back a little bit more as well. Even though the music program and the CYF program are huge reasons why we give and why we love this church, there is more. I get that a church is not just a building, but there's something special about this place. I can't explain it, and honestly, I don't fully understand it. It's peaceful and comforting. It truly is a sanctuary. I'm pretty sure most of you feel the same way. If you're able to give financially, please join our family in doing so. And if you cannot give financially, I hope your cup is filled by volunteering your time and talents because our Savior's Church family needs you. Thank you. For sharing. As we begin our worship service, I'd invite you to stand. And let's just take a moment and greet one another with a sign of peace as we begin our worship. Please remain standing as we sing our opening song, King of Love. One, two, three, four.
us pray together. Lord, it is so reassuring to know that you only want the best for us. You know that we need rest and peace from the chaos of life. So you lead us to green pastures and restore us when we are weary. Thank you for thinking of everything we need. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So much to do. I know. So much to do. I never get to sleep. This looks like a really comfortable spot to just, oh. Uh, yeah, it's okay. I think I have to wake her. Sorry. Yeah, it's been a really busy fall. Uh, <laughs> Psst. Shut up. Children's message. Whoa. Middle of worship. Hi. Hi. I think I was forgetting something. There's so many of you. I don't usually you wake up. Hug? I would love a hug. Thank mm -hmm. you. I don't usually wake up to so many people next to my napping area. Oh, hi. Oh, thank you. So many hugs. Okay. Uh, thank you. I've had this teddy bear since I was about five years old. It's from my grandma and grandpa. Yeah. Yeah, so since about the time you were born. Oh, no. Guys, I'm so tired. I can't even think. Oh, thank you. Well, let me think. Okay. I was just planning on nap time today. Oh, is this a picture for me? Thank you. It's a dollar. I love that. Thank you. There's a dollar for the offering. Okay. Uh, think fast. Think fast. It's a kid's message time, isn't it? Okay. Yes, you are. Okay. Let me think. Uh, okay. What's this? A pillow. What do we use a pillow for? For sleeping on. Why? Why would I use a pillow? It's more comfortable. What about this? A blanket. A blanket. Why, why do I use a blanket? To keep it warm. To keep warm, keep comfortable. What about my teddy bear? To be cozy. To be cozy. To cuddle with. Yeah, to cuddle with, to support me, all of those things. You know what? Kind of like these things, God gives us comfort and rest too. But I'm not talking about sleep for our bodies. I'm talking about rest for our souls. Do you know what a soul is? Yeah. What's a soul? It's kind of a tricky it's word. A, it's something that's like inside your body and no one can take it away. It's something inside your body that no one can take away. Perfect. I love that. It's the thing inside of our bodies that makes us us. And even when our bodies stop working, our soul keeps on living forever. And what, it's your heartbeat. Yeah, it's kind of like our heartbeat, isn't it? It's what makes us us. And now friends, when we know God and we know what Jesus has done for us in our lives and all the things we talk about here at church, we have comfort in knowing that even when our bodies stop working, we get to be with God forever because our souls keep going. Even if you were dead, your friends would help you. Yeah. When our bodies are hurting, our friends can help us, right? Oh, sometimes when people aren't nice, we can help each other. Yeah, there's ways we can give each other comfort. And we take comfort in the ways that God helps us, too. Wow, you guys have a lot more energy than I do this morning. <laughs> Yeah, if you get sick, somebody can help you and give you comfort. Or if you are sleepy and you are sick. Yeah, you guys are so wise. So just like when I need to take a rest for my body, which is really important. Okay, just one second. Well, our rest for our bodies is really important, isn't it? We have to sleep. We have to get rest. We need to make sure to take time to rest our bodies. And it's important for us to realize the comfort and rest that God gives to our souls just by God loving us the way that God does. And when we, we have wiggle worship this morning, so we're all going to stay together, and we're going to have some time of worship, and we're going to talk a little bit more about rest. I won't make you take a nap, but we're going to talk about rest. 
We're going to sing some songs, do a little activity. Why can't we rest? Oh, well, maybe that's on the table. How about this? Before we go to wiggle worship today, let's pray. Will you pray with me? So repeat after me. Nice. You can tell what we do when we're back there. I say, repeat after me, and they'll go, after me. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for things to do, and thank you for rest. Help us take good care of our bodies and our souls, and to trust in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, we have wiggle worship today. So if you're going, you can go out those doors and we'll go into the, the first room. Otherwise, you can find your people you came with. The wilderness story in Exodus is a story of the impossible. It is a story about the promises of a God who upends the Israelites' expectations in so many ways. Like the Israelites, we often live between the anticipation of what might be possible and the inheritance of God's goodness. This ancient story has the possibility to speak in fresh ways to us today, calling us to trust in God's goodness even when the world operates under different means. This morning's scripture reading you will recognize as the third commandment. It is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning again and welcome to worship. First things first, who's got the score? I need an update. 17-7. Okay, so we're doing all right. It's, it's, I think this is the first time ever for me in many years that I have done sermons and been in the ministry that I've actually competed on a Sunday morning with the Minnesota Vikings and the undefeated Minnesota Vikings, obviously, <laughs> woohoo, playing in London, so this is the time. Um, well, you know, I thought I had to gear up for this, you know, so I got my Vikings tie on, got my purple shirt, so good luck. It's been good luck so far. Hopefully we'll have a positive out outcome to this game as well. Well, this has been a truly remarkable fall and beginning of the school year here at Our Saviors, starting with the annual pork roast on Rally Day and that benefited the Guatemala mission trip, we have seen and we have heard about many, many of the wonderful ministries that take place through this congregation. You have given of your time and your talent and your resources to make possible such things as the choir, who will be singing for us, the worship band who is leading us, the handbells who you've heard, the youth and children's ministries that you just saw demonstrated, partnership with Cedar Creek Elementary, which we heard about a couple weeks ago, the little dresses for Africa group, the quilting groups, the beading ministry, the card ministry, the hard hats, the grief groups. And let's not forget the people who prepare and bring treats and coffee following our worship services. That's just to name a few of these ministries. And then there are the other important leadership roles that sometimes don't get mentioned or maybe a little overlooked. Those of you who serve on our church council, some who serve in stewardship and finance, 
We have our church staff, which really is the glue that, that holds all of these things together. We've seen the exterior of the church improved. If you haven't noticed, take a look. New siding this fall. And of course, the parking lot has been um, repaired and resurfaced as well. We're hoping to do some interior remodeling um, in the upcoming months that will make better use of the interior space that we have here in the church. And all of this is taking place during a time of transition in the congregation. Pastor Maria is now one of the pastors at the church that I was confirmed in as a 14-year-old kid. And uh, Melissa and I were married there back in 1978. My 97-year-old mother is still a member there. This is Normandale in Edina. All of this is happening dur during a time when the world and our nation are very conflicted, divided, and under incredible stress with the heart-wrenching wars we hear about every day the uncertainty of the election, the terrible devastation from Hurricane Helene. And yet through all of this, you have kept doing what you are able to do in this place for this community and to help where possible with other folks a long distance from here. And for that, on behalf of all of us, I say thank you. Thank you for all that you have continued to do. I, too, invite you to next Sunday's worship service, 1015. <clears throat> One service only, bluegrass service. Guaranteed there'll be some banjo jokes, I think, probably. Who knows? We'll see. And at that service, I'll have the opportunity to make new commitments to our church so that all these ministries can continue and move forward in the upcoming year. After it, or all done, we get a meal together, a catered meal, which is always a beautiful thing. So I hope you can all make it next Sunday if possible. <clears throat> so today, though, I'm going to go in a, in, a, in a very different direction. Rather than speak more about the activity within the congregation I want to talk with you about a gift from God that is really not talked about that often in the church. But it's a foundational gift. In fact, if I dare say that without it, none of these ministries would take place. Or if attempted, they'd be done poorly. It is the gift of rest. Yes, rest. So that in the spirit of rest, I invite you to kind of relax, lean back, make yourself comfortable, maybe not quite as comfortable as Leisha there in, uh, in the, the children's message. And during this time, I want to take a look at several Bible passages which speak about the importance of rest. From the very beginning of creation, rest has been built into the fabric and rhythm of life. Rest has never been optional. It has always been a necessity. We see this in the creation story. This is Genesis 2, verses 1 and 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. The creation story includes a rest day, day seven. Well, it must have been incredibly challenging and difficult for the Lord to create the heavens and the earth. And so when it is finished, God rests. Rest is part of the fabric of creation. It is so vital that even God, the creator, rests. Which is the very opposite of the culture in which we find ourselves. We value working hard from sunup till sundown. 
pursuing goals, filling every moment of every day with some activity, being as busy as you can possibly be. It's almost a badge of honor in our culture to be very busy. But God rests. So this speaks to the value and importance of rest in our lives. But there is more. This is verses two, or verses two, Genesis 2, verse 3. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. The rest day is given a special blessing by God. It is the blessed day. The other six days are good and indeed very good, but day seven is the day of rest. So don't let yourself fall into the cultural trap that diminishes rest and elevates work. Rest is blessed and it is necessary for us to function. It provides for what we need both physically and mentally. Who among us has not had those days where we run from one thing to the next, fill it, fitting in one more important activity only to, to collapse in physical and mental exhaustion at the end of the day. Fortunately, rest renews and refreshes us, making it possible to rise to a new day and to continue to do what we are called to do. And notice that not only is rest blessed, it is hallowed, which is to say it is holy. When we stop doing all of those daily, often stressful activities, we can enter a space of reflection, of gratitude, of praise to God for all the blessings that fill our lives, for the beauty of creation, for the love of family and friends, for the gift of faith, for our church family, for the arts and the sciences, for each breath that we are given and hearts that beat strong. And so much more, <clears throat> we give thanks to God. And when we do so, rest becomes holy. It's holy time. So from the very start of creation, rest is built into life. It is blessed. It is holy. The next passage on Sabbath and rest, this is one well that's well known to many of you. It has certainly shaped the pattern of our lives. And it is the third commandment, which I read for you earlier. <clears throat> So the day of rest, which is mentioned as part of the creation story, becomes part of the Jewish law, the Ten Commandments. So now the teaching we find in Genesis is spelled out in more detail. And here it says specifically that no one in the community is to do any work on the rest day. It's commanded, right? The Ten Commandments, not just suggested. And this applies to everyone in that community, parents, children, slaves, livestock, even the outsider who may be present, the resident alien. Everyone is to cease work and rest. And this... Old Testament commandment, as well as what we read in Genesis, has really shaped the way that our lives are ordered. We have a seven-day week, week, and not only here, but 
throughout the world. You know, there's really no reason that a week has to be seven days. Could be four days, could be six days. We really don't have to have weeks at all, quite frankly. But of course, it's patterned after the six days of creation and the day of rest, which has been followed by the Jewish community for um, millennium and obviously adopted by the Christian community as well. The question for us as Christians is what do we do with this commandment in the modern world? Maybe 3,500 years ago when Moses received the law and the Ten Commandments, when the community was small, when it was close-knit, maybe then you could monitor this commandment not to work. But today, not so much. As Christians, we have long held that we are no longer bound by Old Testament law. We believe that Christ, through his death and resurrection, has fulfilled the law. We are saved by grace through faith, not by following laws or doing certain good works. So with regard to the Sabbath, the early Christians felt free to change the Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday as a way to acknowledge and celebrate the resurrection of Christ. We honor and we follow and we respect the Ten Commandments as important moral principles. But with regard to the Sabbath, we've always allowed for more flexibility. Even Jesus challenged the Sabbath understanding of his day. The problem was that over time, the rabbis had written more and more laws to define what could and could not be done on the Sabbath. They wanted to be clear about what is work and what is not. And to this day in Judaism, there are 39 melachot, or categories of activity that are prohibited on the Sabbath. Underneath those 39, there's a number of other laws that apply. In this particular passage, the disciples pluck grain for bread on the Sabbath. And that's an activity that was prohibited by Jewish law. And then in the story that immediately follows, Jesus heals a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, which was also prohibited by the law. For the Pharisees, the legalists of the day, in forth, enforcing Sabbath rules had become more important than honoring the day itself. And so in doing so, they had missed the point of the Sabbath. By making the Sabbath all about following laws, they were preventing themselves and others from resting and focusing on God. Rather than being refreshed, people were burdened by all of these laws. And so they, in their attempt to honor the Sabbath, to keep it holy, they were actually dishonoring the Sabbath. And that's why Jesus famously says here, the Sabbath was made for man, or humankind, if you will, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is to be understood as a helpful, beneficial gift. It is to serve us. We do not serve it in some legalistic, burdensome manner. And all of this says to me that there is freedom and a good deal of grace in the ways that we observe Sabbath and find rest. 
if the traditional and historic pattern of Sunday as a day for worship and rest fits for you, by all means, continue that pattern and that tradition. It's a good thing for sure. And I promise that we will be here for you Sundays as you begin your Sabbath day. But maybe Sunday doesn't work for you so well. You know, Alicia mentioned, oh, she's a nurse. She had to work. Her husband's a, a police officer. I mean, those days are not, you know, you don't, you don't stop doing those kinds of things for the community. Or maybe it works, but only part of the time. It's okay to find another day, another period of time where you can rest and give thanks to God. Both of our Sunday services are live stream, recorded, uploaded to the website, and you can use this as a resource for Sabbath and another day of the week if you would like. For me, when it's all said and done, Sabbath rest is really not about a day of the week, certain rules and traditions, figuring out what constitutes work, how I might choose to worship, and all those kinds of human things that have been developed. Rather, it's about Jesus, his love for me and my relationship with him. It's about the one who says these words. Come to me, all you are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the presence of Jesus, we have Sabbath rest. That can be done any day of the week, at any time, for whatever period of time that you have. We give our busyness, our stress, our worries, and our burdens to him. I don't know what kind of burdens you are carrying with you today. I do know that there are many daily challenges. Bring them to Jesus. Come to me, he says. He promises to take them and replace them with rest for your souls. And that, my friends, is good news. That, my friends, is Sabbath rest. May we all find such rest in the midst of whatever life brings our way. Amen. The peace of God that passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you.